Good morning. It is fantastic to see everybody here. I walked out of my office and there, there was so much going on in the narthex. It almost reminded me of, you know, the good old, it was really exciting. It was really, really cool. So um, thank you for giving me that cool moment this morning um, uh, because, um, because we need those cool moments, don't we? We need, we need coming together. Um, as, as wonderful as it is to have the online option, there's only one place where we can gather and sit so, shoulder to shoulder and laugh and talk and, and, and have fellowship with other Christians. And that's here. And that's why we're here every Sunday morning. And uh, coming soon, we will also be here on Wednesday nights and uh, other times uh, as we head into our season of Lent. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it because we're going to talk about it. But as we get started, I want to acknowledge what is heavy on my heart and heavy on many of, of our hearts. Uh, in fact, we spent uh, the adult Sunday school class uh, talking about this very thing. And, and that is what is happening with our brothers and sisters even now in the Ukraine. And I say brothers and sisters because whether you're aware of it or not, um, there are many, many Christians in the Ukraine. Um, and, um, and even if they are not Christian, uh, they're still God's creation. And uh, so our hearts go out to them. Um, no one should be in harm's way. And so we want to stand in solidarity with the people of the Ukraine. There have been as, as many stories as there have been that are heartbreaking. There are also some that are uplifting. And, and I saw this, it's literally like 27 seconds long. But uh, people, of course, are taking shelter wherever they can, including in subway stations, because of course it's subterranean and it's safer from a lot of the bombing. Um, and. Um, Inside one of the subway stations, there were Ukrainian Christians that were gathered. And um, in the midst of war, singing broke out. <laughs> just any singing lest you think that they were um, uh, singing the the Ukrainian national anthem I have to trust what what was said in the um, in the subtitles but um, they're singing praises to God uh, and Marty's Marty's um, nodding her head and she's been in plenty of Ukrainian church services so so she knows we might not understand the words but let your heart understand the praise and so in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and in confidence of all that Jesus Christ makes possible for us. I wanted to light a candle this morning so that we keep them in our thoughts, in our prayers, and in our hearts. And I did it with this from the candle of Christ because I also want to remind us of what Jesus calls us to be. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Let us be the light of the world for Ukraine.
Thank you, Dick. You know, I've been um, uh, working with Dick, and, and you know, he's, he's introduced me to um, musical terms of um, a lot of our hymns, more um, upbeat tempo, um, but um, sometimes our hearts need that, um, and, and I appreciate that. Um, we do have uh, plenty going on. Uh, if you have not already picked one up, we do have the, um, the list front and back of all that is going on throughout Lent. Uh, you will find uh, notes about the sermon series coming up on the Holy Spirit. You'll find that we kick off this coming Wednesday already with our Ash Wednesday service. You'll find Wednesday devotionals, and you'll find on Tuesdays devotionals for the kids. And I'm really excited, no offense to the adults, but I'm really excited about the kids' devotional because it's all about Easter candy and how it teaches us about the, um, the real meaning of uh, Easter. I almost said Christmas. The real meaning of Easter. In fact, you know, some of you adults might want to tune into because honestly, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then, of course, when you flip the page over, um, we will uh, end our Lenten journey in Holy Week um, with a Monday, Thursday service and Good Friday. And then, of course, Resurrection Sunday uh, that we call Easter. So um, I hope that you will plan to join us as much as you're able. And as always, all of it will not only be live and in person, but also uh, broadcast live and then afterwards on Facebook and on Zoom. Um, Speaking of, and this is um, unfortunately only live, but I was contacted on Friday by um, one of the leaders within uh, the community, actually several of us were, and we will be having an ecumenical prayer service for Ukraine uh, this coming Thursday, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Tuesday, March 1st at 4.30 p.m. And my apologies because I, I, I wrote it wrong and, and Lori shared it and said 1.30, it's 4.30. So my apologies to that, we wanted to do it. Actually, we were trying to do it when it would be warmest in the day. <laughs> um, and also catch some folks coming off of work. So uh, we will gather at the Fallen Soldiers Memorial. I have no idea, somewhere, I don't know. We will be there. Um, and uh, there are several clergy that I'm uh, working on putting together from the community uh, to offer up prayers and scriptures and, um, uh, and just have a time, hopefully, of coming together and of peace. Um, so any other questions about that, you can, um, you can check with me. Lastly, I want to um, uh, offer some birthday wishes, and I am really excited because somebody's here that um, I thought I was just going to have to go on Facebook for. So um, we'll, we'll do proper first. Uh, today is Bernice Watson's birthday. So um, if you know Bernice or you happen to be over at the Willows, please give her a shout out. But it's also Hunter Bless's birthday. So happy birthday, Hunter. That's so awesome. Um, Monday is uh, tomorrow, Tom Conley's birthday, and I know at least Cheryl is watching on Zoom. Uh, I saw her name, so happy birthday, Tom. And Wednesday is Abby Gerber, celebrates her birthday. Thursday, also at the Willows, Vivian Jett. Friday, Karen Doherty celebrates her birthday, so happy birthday early, Karen. And rounding out the week on Saturday, Lexi Hunter celebrates her birthday. Did you know that? Okay, all right, all right. I'll keep you informed here. All right, lots going on, uh, and lots still going on here. So let us rise, and uh, we've had our time of meditation uh, music. Let us now rise and sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
we're kind of bouncing. All right, thank you so much. All right. I was trying to do it subtly, Lee. <laughs> Nothing subtle about Lee. That's why I love him. All right, let us join together now. We have joined our voices in song and in prayer. Let us join together in a responsive prayer this morning. Great is the grace and glory of God. We give thanks with hearts of joy. Great is the courage and hope of our Lord. This, this great is the love and compassion of Christ. With him in our hearts, let us pray. Holy God, bring us to your mountaintop and reveal your glory to us. Your glory can transform our lives. So fill us with your spirit and teach us to shine as well. Let us shine with the light of your love and illuminate the darkness of our world so that everyone can know your glory and your love. Amen. All right. I would like to invite any of the kids who want to to come up. And if any of the kids want to come up with adults, that is fine as well. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm a great big kid, right? Yep, yep. You answered a little too quickly there. You just know me really well, don't you? Well, I am very excited because I haven't really worn this stole much, maybe once. Hey, Avery, come on up, sweetie. You can sit right down there. All right. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Well, I am excited to wear my stole again. I haven't done it too much during the winter, but um, it has some of my favorites on it. What's on my stole? Butterflies. Do you guys like butterflies? I do too. I do too. Uh, of course, they're not always butterflies though, are they? Oh, well, there's sometimes they're a moth, but now the butterflies that come out in the spring, they started a different way, didn't they? Did they, did, did, were they, were butterflies born butterflies? No, what are you going to say, Corey? They were caterpillars, right? Those little, those little fuzzy inchworm things that, that you see? They do, you're absolutely right. Caterpillars build, and you know what that white house is called? It's called a cocoon. They spin a cocoon all around themselves, and then when they come out, they're a butterfly. Now, does a butterfly look a lot like a caterpillar? No, no it doesn't. Absolutely. Yeah, do you think the caterpillar would like to fly? Yeah, I think so too. Would you guys like to be able to fly? Yeah, I would too. I think that would be the superpower that I would uh, pick. You would like to be invisible? Oh, I'll bet I know at least two people who wouldn't like that. <laughs> I'll tell you later. Well, the caterpillar might want to fly, but can a caterpillar fly? No, but you know what? God designed the caterpillar so that the caterpillar can be transformed into a butterfly that can fly. So we don't always think about it this way, but whenever you see a caterpillar, you can look at that caterpillar and say, someday you're going to fly. The caterpillar might not believe you if the caterpillar even understood human talk, but the caterpillar wouldn't understand that he could fly, but God knows. And guess what? God knows that there's more to all of us as well. When we start out life, we're kind of like the caterpillar. Good thing is we don't have to crawl around on the ground. But God has created all of us to be able to fly. Not in a, not in a literal sense. We can't spread our wings or, or take off like Superman. 
even though, darn, that would be so cool. It'd be much easier to get to my mom's house. But we can't do that. But sometimes we talk about flying in, in, in our spirits as being really happy and being everything that God wanted for us to be. Maybe a little bit, especially if you had a glider, right? But God means for us to fly in a sense of being loved and, and being, being really, really happy. Sometimes we talk about that as flying. And we might not be everything that we want to be now, but God has great things in store for us, just like God has for the caterpillar that's going to become a butterfly. And today in the adult sermon, we're going to talk about a time when Jesus when his disciples got to see what was really inside of him. And it was all of his glory as God. And that's inside of all of you as well. God's created you to fly. You just have to ask God what that means and how you can do that. And then keep working forward and trusting God because the caterpillar might not think he can fly, but God knows that he can. And you might not think that you can fly in a spiritual sense, but God knows you can. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for creating us as we are, but for also creating us for great things. God, you have created each and every one of us to fly. Not literally like the butterfly, but you have created us to fly in terms of being happy, in terms of being fulfilled, in terms of doing what you have created us to do. God, you have created us to be more than what we are now. Help us to trust you so that that more can come into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So how about this? You're welcome. All right. Hold the... Hold that thought just for a second. Yeah, we have red and orange and brown and purple. Do you have a favorite? A red one? You're welcome. Well, we'll just have one. <laughs> we'll save the other ones for next week, okay? All right. Miles, I'd set you up too, bud, but too young. Today's scriptures are coming from Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful world, word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Gail. For our second scripture today, we turn again to Luke's gospel. Today we're looking in chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. It is the story of the transfiguration, and it says this. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. 
They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. But while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, it is your word, and it is for us, your people. You know, God, that we need guidance. We need answers. We need help in our lives. And all of this comes from your word. And so open our hearts and our spirits this day, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to see the guidance. Help us to see all that you have for us in your holy word. Amen. All right, I know some of you know this, not all of you do, but um, I have a previous life. I'm not talking about anything like uh, reincarnation, nothing weird like that. I'm talking about a life that honestly for me does feel like it was an entirely different life. And that was the life that I spent when I worked in the theater. That's right, I am a second career pastor for those who didn't know, I think most of you do. And my first career was of all places in the theater, not on stage. Ironically, I really do not like standing in front of people. Um, God has a sense of humor. No, I worked behind the scenes. I, I built the sets, I hung the lighting, I did the sound. Sometimes I think not a lot has changed in that regard. And for the most part, I don't miss the theater. I, I really don't. It's, it's a lot about, especially I was working at the level in New York and, and I loved many of the people that I worked with, but working in New York City in the theater is a lot different than being over at the Bellevue Society for the Arts. A theater is a lot about ego, and I don't miss any of that. There's one thing that I miss, one thing that I loved as a technical director, and that was engineering and problem solving special effects. I got to do that. That came across my desk. That was my responsibility, and I loved it. I loved figuring it all out, whether it was just simply problem solving, making something happen that wouldn't happen otherwise, or if it was a legitimate, like you would think of, special effect. And what I love the most about it is that while some of the special effects were complicated, the majority of them were so simple. Most of them utilized common everyday objects. In fact, when I was problem solving a special effect, I would simply go to Home Depot and walk around randomly, usually in the plumbing section. Plumbing and HVAC, there's a lot there to do uh, special effects. I did learn the hard way that when someone says, what are you looking for? Especially as a woman, you do not say what you're about to do because they will look at you like you have two heads and, um, and, and not be the help that you need. But I loved doing that. So I have a question for you and with apologies to those at home and the apologies that we do not have theater lighting, so it's not quite as evident, but um, look at the back door over here behind me. Um, right about at, at where eye height would be, um, what does it look like on the door? Like, what's that? Oh, a dot and a spit wide. Okay, all right, this is going swimmingly. If we were in the theater, <laughs> this is a trick that I used to create a peephole. Um, doesn't look like that from our distance, clearly. Um, and I noticed that myself, but I had uh, passed the point of no return. But in the theater, when it's lit and the lights reflecting off of it, uh, it looked like a peephole. 
Now, what it is, is a dime with a black dot on it. I just made a black dot with a Sharpie and put a peephole up. As soon as I put it up, I knew it was too small for the door and it probably wasn't gonna work. But trust me, I did this several times in the theater and it looked, you'd walk 10 feet away and you'd swear that it was a peephole on the door. And it worked really, really well. And the whole premise of most special effects is that you trick the mind to making an assumption. Now, it didn't work here uh, in this situation, clearly. But when I did this in the theater, because it was right where a peephole was, and maybe it helps if an actor interacts with it as a peephole, people would draw the conclusion that you had a peephole on the door, even though it was just a spit what dime um, <laughs> taped up to the door. Maybe don't try this at BSA unless you have the right lighting. There's another great special effect. This one, this one I am not demonstrating, but um, same idea. We, when we had a prop gun fired on stage, as anyone who's ever fired a weapon knows, if you fire it on stage, there ought to be a hole in the wall, right? Well, obviously we're not firing live rounds. That doesn't make any sense, nor is it safe, but we could make it look like there was a hole in the wall by using something as simple as a mouse trap. You just simply drilled a hole in the wall, filled it with plaster, put the mouse trap in behind, and in the very moment that the prop gun was fired, somebody triggered the mouse trap, it popped out, you had the hole in the wall, and you even had the spray of all of the dust. Simple stuff. And it was just about creating the effect. I even did want something one time for problem solving when for the glass menagerie, we had an actor who was supposed to spin around and knock all of his sister's little glass figurines off of the shelf. The problem was the shelf was uh, had bars on either side and when he spun his coat around, the bars hit his coat and wouldn't allow them to knock over the figurines. And this was a pivotal moment in their relationship. And so using pieces of plexiglass, clear plastic drinking straws and heavyweight fish line, I made a little trip shelf so that in the very moment that he spun around, somebody pulled that fish line, shoved the plastic drinking straws up and tumbled those little pieces off and nobody was the wiser. And that's what special effects is all about. Regardless of what it is, whether it's something really, really complicated and expensive to pull off, whether it works or not, it's all about the premise that there's always more than meets the eye. That's really what's behind all special effects. I mean, even I saw, I saw Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. I saw the Beast transform. And you would probably actually be angry if I told you how it happened because it's so simple. I'm not going to tell you. Nope, I'm sorry. I'm not even going to tell you if you approach me afterwards because um, I've fallen into that trap once before. There's more than meets the eye. It's, it's almost always true. That's how magicians do what they're doing. That sleight of hand, that, that the hand is faster than the eye. And the reality is, is this is a good thing for us to think about, not for special effects, but because the same thing is true in our own lives. I mean, think about the person in this world that you know better than anybody else. And now think about how often you learn new things about them. It's always true. We can even learn new things about ourselves that we didn't know. I, I know taking some counseling classes, that was a big part of it. Learning more about yourself than even you were aware of. The truth is only God knows all of us perfectly. And so for the rest of us, whether it's getting to know ourselves or getting to know our friends and relationships, it's always this wonderful journey of discovery. And isn't that part of what makes friendship so wonderful? Getting to know one another? And the same thing is even true of Jesus. And that's really what today's scripture is about. Now, transfiguration is a very fancy word in the church that means changed from the inside out. And basically, in that moment, on top of that mountain, with Peter, James, and John as his witnesses, Jesus was transformed or really revealed in his divine self. Jesus came to earth and functioned as we do as a human being, flesh and blood, something that the disciples didn't think two, two, um, two thoughts about. And yet in this moment, 
On top of that mountain, Jesus was revealed as who he really is, the almighty, divine son of God in all of his glory shining forth with Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the great prophet, standing near to encourage him, to affirm him before he turned his face to the cross. Can you even imagine what that was like for his disciples? They had been with this man for nearly three years. And I, I have to imagine that there was a lot that they had gotten to know about him. They had seen the miracles. They had heard the teachings. They had watched his example. And I suspect that somewhere in their hearts, they knew that there was more, more to this rabbi from Nazareth. But I don't think they ever could have imagined this. I mean, I, I sincerely believe that they believed that he was sent from God, that he was empowered by God to do all that he did. I also believe that they, that they thought that his words were divinely inspired and that when they heard him speak, they should listen. They didn't need God to say that at the transfiguration. I think they knew that before. This man speaks for God as the prophets of old did. Listen to him. He has God's word for our lives. And we even know that at least Peter, and to an extent I believe the other disciples as well, did believe that Jesus was God's Messiah, the one that was promised, the chosen one, the anointed one, who would come and save Israel and reunite God's kingdom. But even they couldn't have possibly imagined when they headed up that mountain how much more they would actually see. I mean, we say there's more than meets the eye, but oh my goodness, the more that those disciples got to see that day. I mean, literally, it kind of left them bumbling a little bit. For the most part, I have to imagine that it took their breath away and left them speechless, which is why Peter said what he did. He just wanted to preserve the moment. Peter was always one to speak. Peter was rarely at a loss for words, whether it was helpful or not. They got to see the more about Jesus than meets the eye. And so that got me to thinking this week, what about us? I'm not talking about going up on a mountain. I, I, I love mountains. I will hike to the top of a mountain every opportunity you give me the chance to. But I have never met Jesus in this way up on top of a mountain. You can try, but first of all, there aren't a lot of mountains around this area, and I just don't think that going up on one of those mounds around the reservoirs is quite the same thing. But we can have an encounter with Jesus in a personal sense. It doesn't mean that Jesus can't reveal himself to us. It doesn't mean that we can't think in our own lives, wow, there's more than Jesus than meets the eye which means that there's more to Jesus than what I know. What is that more? And then seek after that more. I mean, the disciples did it rather unknowingly, but they did it. And they did it with an important first step that we all have to take. If you wanna know more about Jesus than what you currently know, more than meets the eye, if you wanna be blessed with the same kind of revelation or similar in your own hearts that the disciples experienced on the mountain that day, not a glowing face and dazzling white clothes, probably not Moses and Elijah, but we have them right here in the scriptures for us. But if you want to know the more about Jesus, you have to do, we all do, the first thing that those three disciples did. They went. Jesus invited them to go. I, from what I know about Jesus, I can guarantee you he did not force them. He invited them. He invited them to go. They didn't have to go. Peter could have said, oh, you know what? My feet are really kind of aching. We walked an awful long ways yesterday. I just, I do not want to climb up that mountain. John could have said, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm really tired. I didn't sleep well last night. I'd kind of like to stay down here with the other disciples and take a nap. They could have had all kinds of excuses. They didn't have to go. They chose to go. And here's why that matters. We don't always know what's gonna happen when we choose to follow Jesus. We receive the invitation as they did, and we have a choice as to whether or not we follow as they did. 
we don't, we're not guaranteed anything. They didn't know what was going to happen up on that mountain. Jesus didn't say, hey, you guys, I'm telling you, you may have sore feet. You may be a little tired, but if you don't go with me, you're going to miss out. There wasn't any of that. It was just an invitation. Same kind of invitation that we all receive all the time. But because they went, look at what they experienced. Because they went, they got to see the more about Jesus. They got to experience something that the other disciples didn't. Prior to Jesus' resurrection, these three disciples, because they made the choice to follow Jesus, even though they didn't know where he was going to lead them or what would happen, Jesus was revealed to them in all of his divine glory. And I have to imagine that their lives were never the same after that. So how would you like that to be about your life as well? How would you like to have such an encounter with Jesus that you can honestly look back and say, my life has never been the same since that? You can, because Jesus is continually inviting all of us. But we've got that choice. We have to decide to go if we want to have the benefits of following Jesus, if we want to see Jesus can't reveal himself to us in any way if we're not following him, if we're not there where he is, in a spiritual sense, of course. We can make our excuses. We can ask for a rain check. He is continually inviting. There will be another invitation. But why miss out? I mean, whatever our excuse might be, maybe we don't think it's a good time. Maybe we think we're not ready. Maybe we don't feel qualified or worthy. If Jesus is inviting us, Jesus thinks that it's the perfect time. Jesus believes that we are ready, are qualified, and are worthy. We're the ones who doubt all of that. He's not, or he wouldn't be inviting us in the first place. Jesus is inviting us to tremendous experiences, but we have to decide whether or not we're going to follow where he leads. Now, it's not easy. I grant you it's not. It was a lot easier for those disciples to simply hike up a mountain that day. A lot of times in our own lives, when Jesus calls us to follow him, it's not just simply up a mountain. It's into the unknown. It's maybe into a new job or into a new relationship. It's to speak out against something that maybe makes us uncomfortable or to stay silent about something that we really feel moved toward. It's about following where Jesus leads us and trusting his lead rather than trying to take the lead ourselves. It's kind of a little bit like dancing in some respects. And who leads determines the dance. When we follow Jesus, then not only is the dance going to be amazing, but we will also benefit from seeing Jesus revealed in our lives. Make no mistake, there is always more to Jesus than any of us know. Any of us, including the Pope, that was the highest religious position I could think of. But Jesus can always reveal more to us because there's always more than meets the eye. So we are about to begin the season of Lent. We are also in the midst of this very difficult time wrestling with how as Christians do we respond to war, to uh, invasions, to people doing things that aren't necessarily Jesus' teaching. How do we as Christians respond to any of that? So for Lent, I have a suggestion. A lot of Christians give something up for Lent. And usually in talking to folks, it's like giving up chocolate or soda. And then I talk to them and it's something that they can't wait to get back to as soon as it's over. So instead of giving something up that won't make any difference in your life, how about instead we all join together or individually and make the choice to give up on our excuses? How about if we decide to give up on assuming that we know everything about Jesus so we don't have to worry about what the more than meets the eye? How about if we give up on trying to do things our own way and instead trust Jesus even though we don't know where that path is going to lead and what's going to happen? How about if we just give up and give in, surrender to God, trusting that God does have a plan for us and for all, and trusting that God's love is sufficient for us and for all.
The scriptures tell us when we do that, we will have, among other things, the peace of God dwelling in our hearts. And I don't know about you, but if that's what I came out of Lent with, the peace of God in my heart, in the midst of everything going on in our world, I think that'd be a pretty successful Lent. So I invite you to come on Wednesday to begin this journey with me. But more importantly, I invite you to hear Jesus's invitation to each and every one of you, an invitation to an amazing journey, a lifelong journey of discovering the more than meets the eye. Amen. can have a seat. And as you do, we have another invitation, an invitation to give back in recognition of what we have already received. God uses our gifts, not just to keep the electricity on, but also, and really more importantly, to reach out and turn God's light on in the hearts of God's people. That's what our giving does. And that's what this moment is about. We are all invited. Will the ushers please come forward?
do praise you. We give you thanks for all that we have received from you and thanks for being able to give back to you, for partnering with you in the building up of your kingdom in the hearts of your people. Bless our gifts, God, even as you have blessed us with them and let them be used according to your will. Amen. Thank you all. All right, as we come to our time of prayer, um, goes without saying, we definitely want to keep uh, the people of Ukraine in our prayer. Um, and because Jesus teaches us to, um, we are also going to pray for the, um, the Russian people, um, those who are not inclined toward war, and those who are making war, that God would soften their hearts and would turn their hearts around. So as a family of God, let us pray together. God, we come before you with hopeful but heavy hearts. We know what we read in the scriptures. We believe that your love for us is real. We know that you have offered us through your son salvation and forgiveness, that you have promised us an eternal home someday, and that you walk with us in this world even as we struggle and go through times of trouble. And yet God, sometimes even knowing all of that, even with all of that in our hearts, sometimes it is so hard when we deal with issues that we're bombarded with left and right like we've experienced this week. God, we, our hearts cry out, why? We wonder where you are in the midst of everything and we wonder what we can do. We know what we would like to do. We know what our hearts tell us. And yet, God, we seek your answer. We seek your way. And we seek your Holy Spirit to help us have the courage and the patience to follow in that direction. We know, God, that every choice we make makes a difference in our lives. Sometimes that difference is positive and sometimes that difference is not. Sometimes the choices that we make bless others. And sometimes the choices that we make harm others. And yet you gave us this choice. We might not always understand it, God, but this is the extent of your love for us. And so for, we pray this morning for those in the Ukraine who are being harmed by the choices of others. We pray for those who even now are fleeing their homes, waiting at the border, trying to get somewhere safe. We pray for the children who aren't able to leave areas like the Good Samaritan home, those who are, are, have physical difficulties that don't enable them to flee as others do, and yet have the wherewithal to feel terror, terror in the midst of their home. We pray God for them and for those who care for them. We have a connection with the Good Samaritan home, God, and we pray a special blessing for them but not just for them. We pray for everyone. Our hearts are broken by everything that we see on the news and read in social media. Our hearts are aligned with yours in this way, God. Let our hearts continue to be aligned with yours. Fill us with your love. Enable us, even though it is difficult and what we really want is retribution, God, through your Holy Spirit, enable us to pray for those whose choice is now harming others. Because it's only through you, God, only you can turn their hearts around. Only you can soften their hearts. Only you can lead them to the ways of love. We don't know whether or not that will happen. Help us to align with you so that we can have your peace in our hearts rather than being filled with anger and hatred. These things have no place in a heart filled with love. They seep in, it's natural. It's what we think. It's the world in which we live. But God, you asked us to rise above the world. And through Jesus, you have given us the ability to do just that. Through again, through your Holy Spirit, lift us up. Enable us to be transformed as Jesus was transformed on the mountain, as the caterpillar is transformed into the butterfly. Enable us to fly above the ways of the world and to become who you call us to be as your children 
echoing your ways and your love. In the moment, God, we pray that you would help all of those who struggle. Whether in the Ukraine or here in our own homeland, we pray for protection for all of those in harm's way. And we pray that you would bless those who are struggling with health issues, with grief, with addiction, with mental health concerns. There are so many things in this world, God, that are not what you intended. And yet we are reminded that you are still in control of it all. Help us to trust you following in the example of Jesus who trusted in you, even when that trust led him to the cross. We end our prayer with voices and hearts united, praying the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us close out in song with voices lifted, even as the Ukrainian voices were lifted in that subway. To God be the glory. God has done great things and all because God loves us that much. And so with that love in our hearts, following Jesus's example, even when it's not easy, but empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so, let us go forth from this place, knowing that while worship may have ended, our service just is beginning. Amen. <laughs>